Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third of four distinguished faculty lectures for the 2022-2023 academic year. Um, please, there are plenty of seats uh, if you'd like to come forward. Um, I am Provost Tricia Sirio, and again, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, today's lecture is entitled UMass and the Large Millimeter Telescope, presented by Peter Schlerm professor in the Department of Astronomy in the College of Natural Sciences. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just take a moment to explain how this event will proceed. After Professor Schlerb's presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions, and Professor Schlerb will then be presented with the Chancellor's Medal, which is the campus's highest recognition. Um, and then at the conclusion of today's event, we'll have a reception with a special menu from UMass Dining, and a recording of this lecture will be posted on the Distinguished Faculty Lecture webpage in the coming days. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Nathaniel Whitaker, who serves as the Interim Dean of the College of Natural Sciences. Dean Whitaker, would you please introduce our distinguished lecturer? Uh, so it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce uh, Professor Peter Slurp, who has a bachelor's degree in, in geology from Hamilton College and earned his PhD in planetary science from Caltech and then joined UMass in 1981. Over the course of his career, Professor Slurp has had a distinguished record of, you know, as a planetary scientist, including modeling heat transfer in planetary surfaces and making some of the first radio wavelength observations of molecules in planetary atmospheres. He is particularly well known for his study of comets, including groundbreaking measurements of, of their composition. In the 1980s, he serves as a radio science discipline specialist for the International Watch for Halley's Comet, coordinating observations from essentially every country in the world. And his key role with the microwave instrument for the Rosetta Orbiter on the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission uh, to Comet 67P was honored by his, in his inclusion in two NASA Group Achievement Awards. Moreover, P Professor Slurp has made important contributions to the study of chemistry and physics of interstellar molecular clouds, the sites of star and planet formation. What's sort of ex exciting to me about uh, Professor Slurp is the International Ast Astronomical Union recognized him by naming an asteroid for him, okay? <laughs> asteroid 9273 Slurp, okay? <laughs> Professor Slurp has a track record of excellence in teaching and mentoring. He has routinely offered research experiences for both graduates and undergraduates. He developed the Astronomy's Integrated uh, Experience course. The students consider important social problems where scientific knowledge informs decision-making process. Past course topics included space exploration, public perception of black, black holes, climate change, and climate intervention. intervention. Professor Sklerb is a member of the EHTC, Event Horizon Telescope Collabor Collaboration, which is a large array of telescopes that were awarded seven prestigious national and international prizes since 2019. The EHTC obtained its first images ever of the early horizon around a black hole, which is the last orbit beyond which gravity is so strong that even light cannot escape, both in our galaxy and a nearby galaxy. The black hole image attracted enormous international attention. The AHTC result would not have been possible without the inclusion of the UMass Mexico Large Millimeter tele Telescope into the cluster of observatories used by the collaboration. This inclusion was only possible because of P Professor Slurb's leading role. Over a span of almost 30 years in making the, the L LMT a reality, from conception of the idea to construction to operation. 
The ARCS Foundation recognized Professor Serb's distinguished scientific career by selecting him in 2021 as an inductee in their annual Hall of Fame. We are truly honored today to have Professor Peter Slurb deliver our distinguished faculty lecture, which acknowledges the work of our most esteemed and accomplished faculty members. Welcome. Thank you, Dean Whitaker. Um, I'm sure Alexandra, my, my wife, is taking notes, and, and uh, you'll, you'll be getting that invitation to my funeral. Uh, to, uh, I'd, I'd really uh, just like to begin by saying thank you for this honor. Um, I would thank you, you know, for myself, but thank you on behalf of our LMT team here at the University of Massachusetts that's worked so hard through all these many years and without whom uh, none of this with the telescope would have been possible. I also would like to take this opportunity, um, gee, I hope I can keep it together. I also would like to take this opportunity uh, to say a special thank you to Bill Irvin. Bill recruited me to come to the University of Massachusetts and uh, has, uh, as, my, as my mentor all these years, uh, has given me unconditional love and support. And I really appreciate that, Bill. Um, okay. Um, all right, so with that, I've always wanted to give like a campus talk about this telescope because honestly, you know, I will go over and meet with you know, people in Whitmore, and when I leave their office, I'm sure they're saying, what the heck is this guy doing anyway? <laughs> um, so, um, so today's my chance to answer some questions. And I know that um, you all have questions. Like, you wonder, well, what is this thing, um, this, this telescope that we've been talking about, and, and what, what does it look, look at? And what, What's it doing on this mountaintop in Mexico anyway, and how did UMass come to be a part of this particular project? And, and how did it come to be? And then today's talk is supposed to have something to do with black holes. So you're probably, well, what does this have to do with black holes? And then finally, there's the question of, does this thing have a future? What is the future of this telescope? Um, and so my lecture today, oh, there was one other question, and that was, how is it that a promising young planetary scientist became an expert on antenna engineering and Mexican labor law? <laughs> so today what I'm gonna do is try to answer most of those questions. I'm still working on the last one. Um, and uh, so let's, let's get started. So what is the LMT? Uh, the, the name of the telescope officially uh, in Mexico is Gran Telescopio Milimetrico Alfonso Serrano. Alfonso Serrano was the leader of the project in Mexico for many years until he, he passed away in 2011. Um, so what sorts of, um, what's the tail of the tape for the telescope? Well, it's 50 meters in diameter. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a slide there about that. Uh, it's 2,500 metric tons, so it's a huge steel structure. Um, we operate at wavelengths um, between a, a little bit under one millimeter and uh, out to four millimeters. Um, you know, just for reference, the thickness of a dime is 1.3 millimeters, and that's a, one of our you know, uh, uh, workhorse uh, wavelengths at the telescope. The reflector surface of the antenna um, is, uh, uh, is, good, uh, is a parabola to about 80 microns precision over the whole uh, antenna, and that, that's a couple of human hairs. Um, and uh, we point the antenna to an accuracy of one arc second. So if you get your dime out again, that's uh, a dime at a, at a couple of miles. Right? So, so we take this enormous steel structure and we line it up to incredible accuracy and point it to incredible accuracy as, as well. 
thanks in large part to my colleague Kamal Sukar, who's our uh, antenna engineer. Now, just to give a sense of scale, I'm hoping that I can maybe in, in, interest uh, you know, senior members of the administration in actually going to the site and standing under it and seeing what it's like. But uh, basically, the, the top of the antenna is about 58 meters uh, above the ground level. The grad tower where I work is 64 meters. So this gives you a sense of the scale and a sense of what's, you know, what would it be like to stand next to such an object. Well, now, where is it? Um, uh, here is a map of Mexico, and the LMT is just here, about two-thirds of the way from Mexico City to the city of Ver Veracruz. Um, uh, and um, you know, why is it there? Well, it's there because we're in a binational collaboration with the country of Me Mexico. Um, I had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, President Z former President Zadillo, Ernesto Zadillo, who was president of the country when the project started. And he said to me, you know, I always thought it was very ambitious for a state university to collaborate with an entire country. <laughs> well, that's what we do. We have uh, uh, our partner institution, the lead institution down there is the Instituto Nacional de Astrofisica Optica y Electronica. Um, and um, well, our telescope is, uh, uh, you know, this got washed out a little bit, the, the, um, uh, is on top of this mountain, which is called Sierra Negra. It's next. Uh, it's at an elevation of 15,000 feet. It's next to the tallest mountain in Mexico, which is called Pico de Orizaba, uh, which is at about 18 and a half thousand feet. Okay, so what does the LMT look at? So what we look at primarily, and the things that we thought about when we were um, designing uh, the telescope, we look at thermal radiation, or what they call black body radiation. This is, and, and we're all familiar with this. Uh, because uh, basically we know that if you put something in a fire and heat it way up that it will eventually begin to glow. And that's black body or thermal radiation. Uh, here's my picture of a horseshoe that's been heated up. And, and you know that the color depends a little bit on, depends upon the, the temperature of the, of the object. And so maybe it's not too big a stretch to say that in astronomy as we look at objects uh, as we look at different wavelengths of light in the electromagnetic spectrum, we look at we're looking primarily at things of different temperature. So in visible light, we're looking primarily at hot stuff, stars. Um, in the infrared, uh, we're looking at warm things, you know, hundreds of degrees Kelvin perhaps, um, things of planetary temperatures. And by the time we get to millimeter waves with the LMT, we're looking at things that are very cold. So we're looking at completely different sorts of objects. And, and this is one of the features of astronomy, is that every wavelength has a little story to tell us about the universe. Now, to give an idea about, uh, about the different stories, um, over here on the left, I have a picture of a famous constellation. And it, it has the distinction that it's the only constellation that all the professors in the astronomy department know. <laughs> Maybe you're familiar with it, uh, the three stars of Orion, uh, Orion's belt. Um, so this is what we see in the visible light. We see the stars uh, because they're hot. But if, we, if you go to, infer, go to the millimeter waves, then you start to pick up other stuff. And you pick up these, uh, these big clouds of gas and dust um, that are very cold, maybe 20 degrees Kelvin above absolute, about, above absolute zero. So millimeter astronomy, we're able to see these very dense, cold clouds of gas and dust. And if you learn anything today, the thing to remember is that, the, that stars form in these cold uh, gas and dust clouds. Um, and these clouds are probed by millimeter waves, which means that millimeter astronomy is really important to the study of the formation of stars. And the other thing about this all is that the LMT is powerful enough to study the star formation in these clouds, both in our own galaxy and in other galaxies and in very, very distant galaxies. OK, so let's do a little bit more looking around. Um, here in the constellation of Orion, if you follow down to the sword of Orion and look at the second or third jewel in the sword, um, uh, there's a really interesting object, which is called the Orion Nebula. Over here on the left is a, a visible light picture. Um, uh, which, which is a, a, a little less stunning in our projected view than 
I hope. But uh, basically what we're looking at here is hot stuff, hot stars and hot gas, the gas that's heated and ionized by these, uh, by these stars. If we move to uh, the infrared part of the spectrum, uh, we're not so, uh, uh, the, the hot stuff is not so apparent, but we're picking up lots and lots of stars and cool stars and stars that are embedded uh, in a cloud of, of uh, gas and dust uh, that's behind all of this stuff. And if we go to millimeter waves, we see all the way through um, the whole thing to the, um, uh, to, uh, in this case, we're tracing out a dense region in that cloud, a region where new stars are being formed. Now, that's not all you can do. If we look at the brightest spot um, there, uh, it turns out that um, uh, we can see lots and lots of uh, spectral lines. So if you tune your receiver to different frequencies, um, or different wavelengths, uh, you get bright emissions from lots of, line, uh, uh, of different molecules uh, in the cloud. Um, and there's currently something like, uh, this number keeps going up, it's just amazing, uh, is currently around 250 or so known molecular species. And each of them has a story to tell, but I don't have time to tell you that story. <laughs> so let's talk about how UMass got involved um, in, the, uh, in the LMT. And it all started right here at the University of Massachusetts uh, in the Quabbin Reservation. Uh, we had a 14-meter telescope, which when I arrived here on campus was the second biggest millimeter wave telescope in the world. Um, and um, uh, the telescope was inside of this, uh, of this thing that looks like a golf ball, uh, a radome. Uh, and here's, uh, here's what it looked like uh, inside there. Now, we had this big telescope and a very active program, um, and we wanted to stay at the forefront of this field. But it was clear after I'd only been here a couple of years, people were building bigger and bigger millimeter telescopes. And so our group, led by, led by Bill Irvin, uh, began to consider what were we going to do about that. And to make a long story short, we thought we would follow up on what we did best. Operate a big single antenna like this guy and build, build state-of-the-art instrumentation for it. Okay, so this is great. Bill, being the kind of person he is, immediately took that idea to our chancellor and said, you know, here we've got this great group, you know, we're bringing in millions a year and, you know, and, and uh, you know, what are we going to, you know, we got to, we want to build a really big telescope. And the answer was, well, that's maybe a bit of a heavy lift for us. Um, you ought to go find yourself a partner. So we went and found ourselves a partner. Um, actually, um, uh, and this is, uh, this is Alfonso Serrano, um, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the partner was Mexico. Um, uh, Steve Strom, who was our um, uh, uh, five college department chair at the time, had a lot of connections in Mexico, and he knew they were looking for a new big project. So we went and pitched this project, and Alfonso Serrano um, uh, decided that, yes, that was the sort of uh, project that he thought that they ought to be trying to do. Because after all, compared to a lot of big telescopes that you could be talking about building, our telescope is not that expensive. Um, okay, so, so we, um, um, we, we did collaboration meetings like the one that I showed there, which I think was maybe the first um, of those meetings. Uh, we did a lot of going around and standing on mountaintops in Mexico and. Um, uh, here I am on top of Sierra Negra, our, our mountaintop. This at a time when in order to get there, you had to hike the 3,000 foot elevation change um, uh, up the side of a volcano, uh, which was quite a trip. Okay, but eventually we got started and uh, here's a picture showing the um, const uh, early construction of the, um, um, of the foundation for the telescope. Um, uh, as the foundation grew, we so did the collaboration meetings, uh, and here a bunch of us are standing in front of the nearly completed uh, foundation. Um, eventually, we were able to start building uh, the telescope on top of the mountain. We built it in parts, so there was this part that we call the Allidade, which uh, moves in uh, the azimuthal direction. Here is the reflector. 
um, over, that was built basically right next to it and some counterweights that were hung. Um, this all went along and built the, built, the structure, uh, built the structure up. And then on one terrifying day in November of 2005, the two biggest cranes in Mexico arrived at the top of our mountain Attached themselves, uh, attached themselves to our 500 metric ton backup structure, lifted it in the air and carried it over and placed it on top of the Alidade, and then a bunch of happy souls spent the next 24 hours welding uh, <laughs> to put it all together. Well, just a year later, um, we were visited by President Vicente Fox, uh, who uh, dedicated uh, the telescope. And you can see there's been quite a, quite a change back here. Um, so uh, here's President Fox. This is Alfonso Serrano is over here. This is me. I was the senior UMass official. So I had my UMass jacket on. Um, and uh, I have to say, I mean, Vicente Fox is a very um, handsome and charismatic man. Um, and uh, and uh, if, you like, if you like very funny YouTube things, he's also pretty funny on YouTube. Um, uh, okay, so there we were, and here we are uh, uh, just a couple years later. Um, telescope looks really good, right? The thing is that if you've ever built a house, or maybe you watch some of those home improvement shows, you know that basically the house goes up, and it looks a lot like a house, but then it takes for frickin' ever to get it all finished. And that's sort of the situation uh, we were in. We still had to align uh, the surface. We had to install a lot of stuff. You'll notice we're missing a, the secondary mirror up here. Um, and there's something else missing, and that is that if this was uh, a home improvement show, uh, the only part of the roof here, let's say, uh, that's real is the inner part here, and then the outer part would have been covered with blue tarp at this point. So we only had the inner 30 meters or so uh, of, the, uh, of the antenna. Um, our job was, and we were out of money, so our job was let's demonstrate to the Mexican government that this, this situation is under control and the telescope works um, so that then maybe they will provide the money to complete the job. So um, we got busy at that. Um, this is uh, a famous, the famous first light spectrum, um, just a couple of years later, uh, looking at um, uh, the, the, the LMT data is the spectrum, uh, not the beautiful picture in the background. Um, and uh, and we can, uh, this was done with um, uh, an instrument we built here in our lab, the redshift search receiver built by Neil Erickson and Gopal Narayanan. Um, and um, uh, so we had our first, our first light, and then we were able to proceed to put other instruments on the telescope uh, and uh, begin to take some data to demonstrate that the telescope worked well. Um, so this is um, uh, a famous picture from our, uh, from our early science period with the inner 32 meters using uh, Grant Wilson's instrument, which is called Aztec, again built here. Um, and uh, this shows a couple of interesting things. One thing it shows is the intended target, which is a star called Epsilon Eridani. Um, Epsilon Eridani is one of these uh, stars that has a mature planetary system around it. Um, the, the planetary system, the, the, the asteroids in the system grind up dust and, and create a, a ring of dust, which is then molded by the, by the uh, gravitational interactions with the planets that exist there. So that's all very interesting. And this, this picture was far and away the best picture ever taken of this object before, um, uh, before, from before this time. The other thing that this shows, these blobs, these things are not noise. These are what we call submillimeter galaxies. Galaxies, star-forming galaxies at great distances from the Earth. Um, we knew about these things and we knew that, that the LMT would be powerful enough to see them. This is the killer app of the telescope. The LMT is big enough and powerful enough to see these objects. And there they were, just as we thought. 
Another thing, again, using the redshift search receiver that Neil and Gopal worked on, um, here's a set of spectra compiled by my colleague Min Yun um, to show basically that we were able not only to see these things with the Aztec instrument, we were also able to measure the redshift to the object, figure out how far away it was. And, then, and if you can figure out how far away it is, then you can do physics with the object. Okay, so the killer app uh, of the telescope, one of the things that we said we needed to do in order to, um, uh, one of the things that we said we were gonna do uh, in order to make the science case. Uh, under control. All right, so this was enough to convince the Mexican government and also begin to convince the American scientific community that this telescope was really going to work and that we were really going to make a, 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 you know, make a contribution. And so the Mexican government came up with the money necessary to finish out the whole 50 meter surface. And that only took a couple of years. Um, and uh, uh, here a group of us are af shortly after the full 50 meter uh, surface was completed. Um, this fellow here is uh, David Hughes, who is the um, uh, LMT director in Mexico and, and uh, leader of the project down there. Uh, this fellow here is Emir Moreno. Emir is the site manager and the fellow that actually put all of this together. And this guy here is David Gale. David uh, basically is the guy that built all of the high precision surface um, panels uh, for the telescope. Uh, and they're really remarkable. And I'm not quite sure what I did, but they let me be in the picture. <laughs> so, uh, and I have to tell a story that basically, um, I'm really bad when, you keep this in mind, I'm really bad when photographers give me instructions. So the instruction here was, why don't we do a picture kind of like you're on the cover of a rock and roll album? <laughs> so all my friends got the, maybe the instruction was in Spanish. I, 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 all my friends got the idea, but I just kept um, um, smiling. So, um, um, so I, I sometimes refer to this as, you know, John, George, Paul, and Ringo. <laughs> Okay, so the telescope's finished and now we're able to actually do the science that we had always said, said was going to be so important. Um, um, I'm, I, I, so, and I'm a little sorry that the colors aren't quite coming out the way I had hoped. Um, um, but uh, one of the things that we said we were gonna do is we were gonna be able to map uh, you know, galaxies and study the spiral arms in the galaxies. So over here on the left is a visible light picture um, of this galaxy, which is called the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. Uh, and over here on the right uh, is a, 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 a figure from a paper led by my colleague, Mark Heyer, um, uh, who um, uh, uh, you know, put, to, put together the LMT version of the same thing. So we have a telescope that really works. So now I'd like to talk a bit about black holes. And I'd like to use black holes for a number, in a, in a number of ways. First of all, when we contemplated building this telescope, nobody talked about black holes. It was really only when a, 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 a fellow who at the time was at Haystack Observatory named Shepard Dolman came up to me once at a meeting and said, listen, that telescope of yours we could put it with, the other, with other telescopes and we can resolve the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And I said, my God, that's a really great experiment. And so there we were. And you just, so you just don't know when, what your telescope is gonna be able to do and how it's going to be um, uh, used in the future. Now, black holes, Everybody nowadays knows what black holes are. I mean, they're part of the culture, right? I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, there's songs about them. You know, there's movies about them. There's science fiction books about them. So, so we all know about the black holes, you know, light can't escape from the black hole. You know, things that fall into the black hole don't come back, you know. Um, and black holes, above all, are a metaphor 
right? I mean, we use, we use black holes all the time to refer to things where, you know, stuff goes in and it doesn't come back. Um, and uh, on, on occasions, uh, my telescope has been referred to in that way. But, um, but, uh, but, uh, but in any case, we all know about black holes. So, so they're popular in the imagination. And the other thing is that they are touched by Albert Einstein, right? Black holes come about, you know, fall out of Albert Einstein's great theory of general relativity. Um, and if you work on a problem that is touched by Albert Einstein, it is just unimaginably Im important in the, in the world of science and in the broader world, public, uh, public world. So let me give you an illustration. When, when Einstein came up with his general relativity theory, as people do, they, they, when they develop a theory, they come up with tests, things that can be done to test the theory. Right, and there were three famous tests. And one of those famous tests involved um, making an observation that was really hard to do. The theory predicted that when light passed a massive object, that the light rays would actually be bent by the object. Because what happens in general relativity is that, that mass distorts the space around it and cause, and in this case, the light will travel on what in four dimensions is a straight line, um, um, but to us would appear to be curved. So, um, so there was a prediction, a quantitative prediction, uh, and a, a whole experiment was mounted because the only time you were going to be able to see this was during a solar eclipse. So they had to uh, set up the, 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 the measurement. They made the eclipse measurement, and it agreed with the prediction. And so the paper of record, the New York Times, um, uh, uh, commented upon this uh, and uh, said, well, don't worry about the fact that these stars are in the wrong place, because it's OK. Um, the other thing that I think is quite interesting is they, they refer to this theory as something that nobody understands except maybe, maybe a dozen people. But that's an example of testing the theory and uh, with an astronomical observation. Now, this business about only 12 people understand general relativity, I think, is fascinating. Because one of the features of general relativity in the black hole um, is that the, Einstein didn't predict the black hole at all. It, it was predicted because within weeks of the publication of the theory, Carl Schwarzschild did the solution of, for uh, 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 if general relativity assuming a point mass. Okay. And, and what's more impressive is he did it on the Eastern Front in World War I. Uh, and actually, he perished on the Eastern Front. Um, uh, so while you're sitting there, you know, on the Eastern Front, you're, you know, doing these, you know, four-dimensional tensor stuff. And, 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 um, and he, he was done in a few weeks, and he sent the solution to Einstein. And Einstein looks at it and said, my god, I didn't think it would be this easy. So then he shared it with the, with the community. One of the features that then popped out of all of this is that uh, around the point mass, space is curved by so much that it became, becomes essentially infinitely curved. And so a light ray that tries to originate inside of this radius, which we call the Schwarzschild radius to, to honor Schwarzschild, um, can't get out of the black hole. And that's what's going, going on. So it's interesting. Did anybody take this seriously and think that, wow, maybe there are such things out there in the universe? No. Nah. Einstein persistently said, no, no way this happens in real nature. Um, uh, Eddington, who led the previous expedition, said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, but astronomers, being what we are, kept finding uses for the black holes. Uh, and we found places where one might want to go look. Um, uh, and so uh, this actually refers to our, 
our um, experiments where basically we're looking for black holes at the cent centers of galaxies because one of the places that we found that, we, that black holes were useful um, uh, was uh, these things of millions and billions of solar masses of material in a black hole at the center of galaxies. The other place where black holes are useful is uh, stellar mass things um, in some stellar systems. Um, but those guys are so small, there's just no way you're ever going to see them, ever resolve them. But these giants in the centers of other galaxies, including our own galaxy, potentially you might be able to resolve. And so um, uh, here we are again in the paper of record, uh, and this is a picture of the LMT uh, because the, uh, the uh, uh, journalist came up and, uh, and visited us as we thought about how we were going to do all of this. So let me show you where we looked. We looked in a galaxy that's called M87. It's what we call a giant elliptical galaxy. It's at a distance of 54 million light years. So it's way, way, way away. But, um, uh, why would we look there? It's because the, the black hole candidate in the core of this guy was enormous, we expected to be enormous. So we had a chance to actually see him. What's more, I mean, uh, here, so here's an example of the kind of activity you get around black holes and why people thought they might be, uh, um, might be present. Uh, you would get these great jets of stuff. The model basically had the black hole sitting in here inside a great disk of, of material and um, uh, from the rotation of, of all of that, um, you can spawn these jets and have them um, uh, go out, and that was our, our explanation. All we needed to do was have a black hole in there uh, to make this all happen. So how do you make an image of a black hole? We can make the uh, image of the black... Basically, if you're going to do it, you need a telescope that's as big as the whole Earth. And so in radio astronomy, um, we have a technique which is called very long baseline interferometry, where we take uh, individual antennas all over the world, we record the signals at those antennas, and then we bring them back to a central station and play them back together uh, to, um, uh, to reconstruct a telescope that is the size of the Earth. And um, here's some of the telescopes that were involved, and here's our hero up here in the upper right uh, corner. All right, so uh, the, big, the first big run was in uh, April of 2017. Uh, here's Gopal Narayanan, our team captain on this. Uh, and Gopal is really the, the fellow that uh, makes this all really work. Um, uh, uh, with uh, Ron Grossline, who's one of our uh, engineers, and they're installing the receiver that's not going to be necessary to make the observations, um, as we characteristically do at the last possible minute. Um, and uh, and uh, over here is the observing team uh, with Gopal, uh, Sandra Bustamante, who's now one of our graduate students. Uh, and this guy over here, uh, uh, David Sanchez, uh, uh, is one of the guys that really makes this stuff work uh, as well. Now, I'm going to set a record for the Distinguished Faculty Lecture Series, and I'm going to show you my scientific result as the cover right of now. the New York Times, fr front page of the New York Times. So again, boy, I sure wish this was a little bit better, but, the, but, um, but uh, here we go. Uh, we have the shadow of the black hole, which I'm going to try to explain, God help me, um, uh, in, a, in a bit. Um, uh, the bottom side here is a little bit brighter than the top side in this particular ring, and that's because um, this, this object uh, is rotating roughly in this way, so the material down here is coming towards us, and that makes it a little bit brighter. Um, uh, Okay, so the New York Times wasn't the only thing that covered this. Um, uh, here are some, uh, some headlines uh, in London. Um, my favorite is that this is what Brexit looks like from space. <laughs> All right, so to give a, a, a sense of scale here again, um, the, um, uh, a scale I, I like. So the resolution uh, shown here is this little circle. Um, uh, uh, that circle, so this is a, a, a bar that shows 50 micro arc seconds. Uh, so we're resolving at something like uh, 20 micro arc seconds. Uh, 20 micro arc seconds is pretty small. If you take a dime again, so here you can use your prop a dime, instead of a couple miles, which is one arc second, you have to go to 80,000 miles uh, to get to that 20 micro arc second 
range, which is about a third of the way between the Earth and the Moon. Another example I've, I've heard in terms of the resolution, uh, if you have your prop quarter handy. Um, uh, with this resolution, it's possible to read the writing on this quarter from here if you put the quarter in Los Angeles. Okay, so, so that's the angular scale. What about the linear scale? So this guy is a monster, um, uh, about six billion times the mass of the sun, and it's all uh, in the solar system, like the Earth's orbit has a radius, this is my only planetary science for the day, um, uh, has a radius of about, has a radius of about one astronomical unit, and Neptune's at 30, so the black hole actually is uh, the Schwarzschild radius about 129, so, so you know, it's, it would swallow the whole solar system. Six billion solar masses, imagine that. And this particular, radi this particular ring that we're seeing here uh, is about 350. Now I wanted to, I'm a professor, I'm sorry. I wanted to try to explain what was the deal with the black hole shadow. So, um, uh, so uh, and, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it by explaining things backwards. So, so let's, what we're going to try to do is we want to show what you see with the light going out that way. But I'm going to take you the other direction because I think it's easier to understand. Okay, so, so, so here we are. Remember, space is really strongly curved around the black hole. So here I am. I've got a light ray. It's coming in, um, you know, parallel at infinity, and it gets bent a little bit. And as I approach the black hole, it gets bent more and more and more. And then finally, we hit this one spot where the light rays go all over the place. Right? So just this, in, in, in the very short distance between these two, we've got a ray going here and here and here and all the way out back there. And then inside of that, the rays start, start to just drop onto the black hole itself, which doesn't emit any light. OK, so if I reverse the process, we're going to expect to see a big black shadow in the middle. Um, because light can, come in, can, can go out in this direction, originating from any place around the black hole, we get extra light at that particular spot. We get a bright ring around uh, that spot. And so we wind up with, um, uh, with a shadow in this characteristic uh, picture. All right, well, in 2022, we got a, 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 the second black hole. Uh, this one at the center of our own galaxy. Our own center of our own galaxy is a lot closer, so you'd think this one would be easier, but it was actually harder because it's about a thousand times smaller, and because it's so much smaller, it, it, it changes during the time that you're making the observation, which made it very difficult to do. Um, but there's black hole, too. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's it. The easy pickings is over. <laughs> so now I'd like to just um, talk a bit about the future of the telescope. Um, and I think the future is very bright. Now I have to start, my wife, Alexandra, always, always asks me this question. You know, hey, I understand there's this really big millimeter wave instrument in Chile and what is it that your telescope is going to be able to do now that they can't do there? Well, it's true that there is a really big instrument, a uh, big telescope down there. It's got 66 antennas. It's a collaborative effort between Europe, North America, and Japan. Um, it cost on the order of one and a half billion dollars to build. The annual operating budget is a hundred million dollars or so. Um, it has three times the collecting area of the LMT, so you might think, well, you know, gee, based on the collecting area, you know, maybe you guys are out of luck. But it can't do everything. And in fact, there are some areas where the LMT is the superior instrument. For instance, we can make maps of the sky thousands of times faster than this thing can. And the reason is that we take all of our collecting area and we put it all in one place rather than spread it out all over. All over. Um, 
The other thing that I can't emphasize enough in the future is that somebody with a great idea for an instrument and a new observation can build in a laboratory, like our laboratories, can build an instrument and make an exciting new discovery. And I'm going to give you an example of that in just a minute. But let me just diverge one second and say, we all, maybe we all know about the fact that uh, radio astronomy at UMass has already won one Nobel Prize. And that was, how was that accomplished? That was accomplished through a discovery made using an instrument built in our labs and taken to a big, big telescope, the Arecibo telescope. May it rest in peace. Um, so this is a proven, tra proven track forward. The thing is that not only do we know that ALMA can't do it all, the rest of the world knows that too. Because two of the partners, Europe and Japan, are each seeking to build their own big telescope like the LMT. So let me give you a couple of examples. And of course, one of the examples is uh, Professor Grant Wilson's uh, instrument that he's been working on now uh, for a number of years uh, in our lab. Uh, and that's the instrument we call Toltec, uh, which is going to be a transformational instrument for the LMT. This, this is really quite a, quite a, a project with 10,000 pixels. It does imaging at three wavelengths simultaneously. You can make polarization measurements of the light, which is important for studying the dust and clouds. Um, and the mapping speed is much, much faster than is possible with the ALMA instruments. So we're going to be able to do experiments that can't be done. The world understands this, and our user community understands this in the last uh, uh, call for proposals, 60% of the proposals wanted to use this instrument. Um, and we're just about to go into action because, uh, well, here it is installed at the telescope and here's a preliminary result looking at the Crab Nebula. This is the Toltec picture next to an HST, a Hubble Space Telescope picture. So we've got that coming. The other thing that we're uh, excited about uh, um, is um, a project that's called the Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope. So this is the next thing to do. Um, and we're part of a project that the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory is leading to build enhancements to the present um, Event Horizon Telescope. And uh, we're in the course of doing uh, design studies and hoping to start implementing um, um, uh, the first phase of this anyway in the, in the coming year or two. The basic idea is to add a lot of relatively small telescopes, put them all over the world to improve our ability to uh, make, uh, make images uh, with the instrument. So the goal is really to do high sensitivity, to image things rapidly because these things change rapidly. And in fact, what we want to do is we want to make movies. So I guarantee nobody thought about movies of black holes when we were first thinking about the LMT. And why is that important? Well, it's because the, the material around the black hole is very dynamic, it's changing all the time. And in the present configuration, all we're able to see is the black hole itself. We can't see much about what's going on around it. And of course, what we really would like to know is how does the black hole generate that jet? Understand how the physics works in there. Now, just to give an idea, this isn't going to be quite as uh, exciting as I'd hoped. Over here on the left is a, a GRMHD model of the, um, of the black hole spinning and the jet being launched off here uh, to the right. And here is our attempt to reconstruct that with the set of data we think we could get if we put in these extra telescopes and use them with the large millimeter telescope. Uh, so, it's a common thing, and we're very excited about, uh, about this opportunity. I thought I would give myself a minute to um, just summarize and tell you a lesson I have learned. The, the summary is, I think that, you know, we have fantastic prospects with this antenna. The lessons I have learned is that nothing 
is easy. Everything is hard. If it's worth doing, it's going to be hard. And, you know, by golly, I think one of the things that our group can be credited with is that we've stuck with it. And we're going to continue to stick with it as we try to transform this telescope and, this, and, uh, and, and our instruments into a national class observatory to serve our user communities and to do some of these exciting uh, projects uh, in the future. And so let me just close by saying thank you so much for your attention today and, and for your support through uh, many years. And go you mass. <laughs>Thank you so much for that lecture. It was absolutely inspiring. Um, right before uh, Pete started, uh, he said to me, no one ever remembers if the telescope is over cost or late in delivery once you start to see the images. And I think you really demonstrated that today. The piece that he didn't dwell on, and I think is perhaps even more important than that, is that um, it's it's easy to appreciate what comes from that work. What's not so easy to remember is that we wouldn't be here without people like Pete who had the vision to imagine what was possible and the stubbornness, tenacity, <laughs> advocacy uh, to make it a reality. And so for that, I think we all owe you uh, a deep, deep debt of gratitude. Thank you so much. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, there's not a microphone, though. There is a microphone. Thank you. So if you have a question, we'll get a microphone to you, and I'll let you call on people. Oh, okay. Okay. Anybody want to be called on? <laughs> Tenacity is a, is a word that was used to describe Alfonso Serrano a lot. Thank you so much, Professor, for taking the time to speak to us. Um, one question I have is it seems like uh, through your experience, you've worked with a lot of people on a lot of important things. So could you talk to us about uh, some lessons of working with people when things don't go your way, facing difficulties? Because it seems like you have a lot of experience. So I appreciate that. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, yes, if there's another lesson to be learned in all of this, um, and, and particularly regarding working with another country, uh, it's that it's incredibly important to be respectful of everyone's culture as you try to work together, and really one of the things that was kind of a surprise to me for a while was that you can't assume anything. You know, the, when we got started in this collaboration with the group in Mexico, they're all, you know, like they got their PhD at Berkeley or they got their PhD at some place in England or, you, you know, and, and I thought, well, you know, this is just us American PhDs talking to each other and, uh, you know, we're going to get along fine. But, uh, you know, of course, that was not really paying proper attention to the fact that, uh, you know, that the cultures are different and that the, the goals of the different collaborators are different. Um, so, for example, in Mexico, um, it was very important in funding this project it was very important that society get something out of it. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the statement from Ernesto Zadillo was, this is not intended to be a toy for astronomers. We want to see technology transfer. We want to see, you know, human resource development, you know. And 
And it's so necessary to be respectful of the partner's needs and desires as you're putting this all together. Um, it's so, and I mean, in our own group, of course, I'd have to say that I think our group, among astronomers that I know and other groups that I know, I think our group is one of the most, one of the friendliest and most collegial groups you'll ever encounter in astronomy. I mean, I was a grad student at Caltech, and those guys, like, you know, they were gonna, they were gonna eat each other, and then they would eat their each other's mothers. <laughs> so, so I mean, I feel I feel blessed uh, in in having um, um, uh, you know such such a group uh, to work with, but I, you know, I, it is it is so important in these in these collaborations to be you know aware and respectful of the, the other other side. The, I once went to a, uh, now we're getting into Pete's story time here. I once went to a um, um, NSF at one point thought it was a real, would be a really good idea to send people like me to a work, to workshops about project management. And so we went, I went to the workshop and uh, we had the project manager of the LIGO project, which was NSF's favorite project because it was on time and on budget. And this guy was fantastic, Gary Sanders. And, and so he gave us you know, a lecture and he, he basically described how to manage a project. And he kept referring it to it as a simple linear project. And then at some point after listening to this a long time, I said, you know, what if, uh, you know, what if your project involves multiple countries? And, uh, and he says, oh, well, all bets are off. <laughs> expect, he said, expect to spend a lot more time managing this project than you think you're going to have to. And I would say that's one of the lessons that I've learned that I wish I had known when we got started. Yes, Bill. As a planetary scientist, do you have some uh, observations in the solar system that you'd like to make? <laughs> well, I sure do. Um, um, I, I've managed to look at one comet with the telescope, and uh, that was pretty spectacular, I think, although I still have to write the paper. <laughs> um, and um, we had a really great opportunity to observe a, a comet this spring. But unfortunately, uh, you know, circumstances didn't quite work out in terms of availability of instruments and so on at the telescope. So uh, apparently there's a pretty big one coming next year, so maybe we'll be able to do some more work with that. Um, uh, there's, well, you, know, you, you and I know what, the, what, what some of the exciting things to do with that information is. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Manasa. I'm a journalism student here. Uh, in light of the answer to um, the question that the student in the back asked about uh, respecting other people's cultures and working with others, I would just like to ask you about some of the remarks um, that I heard you making uh, right before the talk started. Um, namely, that one of the most interesting things about our new chancellor was that he was from Mexico, um, and quote, that it is a very touchy subject with Mexicans because nobody likes to be told that their neighborhood is unsafe, um, and how you believe that plays into uh, kind of paying attention to other people's cultures and being respectful of them. Yeah. So, so let, me, let, me, let me sharpen that up just a little bit. So um, uh, one of the features of our, of our territory around our mountain um, is that there is, uh, you know, significant organized crime activity. You know, um, one of the one of the significant activities uh, involves uh, stealing gasoline from the pipelines that are taking it from the Gulf uh, into the nearby country. And a couple of years ago, we had some incidents where people were stopped and, you know, on the road and harassed. And so, you know, we, the university, uh, and I, decided to you know, hire a consulting firm to help us you know, deal with this situation. Um, 
And it is um, kind of a touchy subject because the, uh, you know, what I was, was referring to is that, you know, if you live in a, in a place, you know, you, you have a different impression of it maybe than, than some outsider has. Um, for example, um, I grew up in Hyde Park in Chicago. Um, I never felt particularly unsafe, but people that would come into my neighborhood from other neighborhoods would say, wow, it's kind of unsafe around here. And I always felt a little like, well, you know, no, you, you don't really know what you're talking about. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, you have to be, you know, understand that you're always going to have that kind of a, kind of a dynamic, let's say. Now, you know, at the same time that you may not like that, you are aware of the problem, right? Because most of the drug violence isn't visited on Americans. In fact, we're kind of given a pass because, you know, as you just saw in the news, you know, if you kidnap a couple of Americans, like everybody goes crazy, right? But every day there are Mexicans kidnapped and held for ransom and things like that. And, um, and uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, so they know that there are, they know there are problems. Um, Fortunately, in the last couple of years, we haven't had any incidents, and, and uh, I'm hopeful that maybe, you know, things are, things are calming down. I'm also a journalism student. Um, I was gonna, it was really interesting to see the number of years it took to make the, to get the large millimeter telescope, like, on its feet. And I'm sure there were a lot of, like, technological changes over those years. So was it the same, like the plan that you guys had in the 19, in 1990s, was that the exact way it turned out? Or were there like modifications made to it over time? I, w I mean, the, the, the basic concept as, as designed in the late 1990s is basically where we're, where we're going with this. Um, um, the, and, um, you know, like some of the uh, equipment and the hardware, uh, you know, can be improved. And I'm hoping that I'm going to get the opportunity to write a, a, a proposal to replace some of the systems that have now been in, in use for, for a while and, and could be uh, improved. Um, the, um, I'd have to say a lesson learned there is that things that I thought would be easy to do turned out to be very hard. Um, and uh, I mean, I won't, I won't go more into that, but, but you know, things where I could stand up in front of review committees and say, well, we don't think that this problem is going to be hard. And they would all go, yeah, I don't think that problem is going to be hard. Well, it, it's hard. <laughs> but um, yeah, the technology moves, moves on. You know, a lot of this moving around big pieces of equipment uh, and stuff, not, you know, not so. The, the, the place where you really see the technology advances in the instrumentation, and that's why um, I'm, I'm looking forward to us uh, uh, continuing to upgrade the instrumentation and, and come up with new ideas. If I remember correctly, the total investment for this instrument, I'm a big part of it, sorry, this, uh, is about 60 million. Okay, so. Um, and so, what, how, how did that all come about in terms of congressional, you know, directed appropriations? Yeah. So, so my my daddy always said, "Don't talk about money outside <laughs> of the." So, uh, so the 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 real cost of this thing in total is around 180 million dollars, and uh, we've put in about 60 million through uh, basically um, NSF grants uh, and. Um, um, and uh, also uh, the university helped us to attract some, um, um, how shall I put it, um, 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 uh, special appropriations through Congress to uh, 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 get, uh, get a pretty significant amount. So we, uh, uh, should I tell them how much we thought it was gonna cost originally? <laughs> so we're a little bit above that original number. Under budget, on time. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I have a lot of stories about on time and on budget, uh, we, which I won't share. <laughs> It's really now my pleasure to uh, present the Chancellor's Medal to Professor Peter Schlerp. Uh, this is the highest honor that's bestowed on our faculty members on this campus, and you richly deserve that. Deserve that. And so here's, here's the medal, and I'm going to give it to you. So you've already been on a rock and roll music uh, album cover, and <laughs> you're making movies. So here's the Academy Award for you. <laughs>